This is Agriculture Today, and I'm Shelby Varner with the K-State Radio Network. Beginning today's show is K-State livestock economist Glenn Tonser with a cattle market update. He discusses the May meat demand monitor and a special meat demand monitor for Memorial Day and grilling season. K-State's College of Agriculture Dean and Director of K-State Research and Extension, Ernie Minton, continues Monday's show with a statewide update and information on the Agronomy Research and Innovation Center groundbreaking. Concluding today's show is Drew Ricketts, K-State Wildlife Specialist, as he continues his conversation about feeding wildlife. There might be more consequences to bird feeders than previously thought. That and more is coming up ahead on Agriculture Today. You're tuned in this Monday on Agriculture Today, and we're going to start our show as we usually do with a cattle market update. And in to do it today is K-State livestock economist Glenn Tonser. Glenn, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. So getting started with cash cattle markets. So across the board this past week, almost all weight classes, AMS called them higher. So on balance, it was a good week to be a cattle seller. If you're a cattle buyer, you may not necessarily like that because the markets were pretty strong. AMS called the five area fed cattle market at about 182, which is up strong from the prior week. And when we look over feeder cattle, Pratt market is one I took note of here. Most cases were $10 per hundred weight higher on the week. There's some cases of seven or eight, and there's a few cases of 15 actually. But on balance, I would say $10 is a good rule of thumb for this past week. Two lots of context here. There's a lot of 50 head came in at 758 pounds. It went for 221. And that would be a full 10, more like 12 bucks higher than the week before. And then 108 head weighing 840 came in at 216. Round this out with the board before we kind of add non-price commentary. CME, the June live cattle contract, which is nearby, was 177, up nine dollars from the prior week. And then August feeder cattle came in at 242, up seven dollars from the prior week. So there's a lot of strength both in the cash as well as the futures market, both in feeder as well as fed cattle. And it's a combination of tighter supplies and a little bit improving demand signals. And what about the box beef cut out in that instance? AMS called Choice Box Beef at 310 on Friday. That was up six bucks on the week. And called Select at 291, up about six bucks as well from the prior week. So that's one of the points where beef went for a higher price, which enabled higher cattle prices. And behind that, we have support from the cattle and feed report, which was broken down a week ago which is mainly a supply-oriented story. We know the industry is going to continue to be basically challenged on hooves and therefore pounds available. If consumers sustain decent demand, it's been weaker, but it's improved a little bit in the last month. If we can just kind of hold our own there, those tighter cattle supplies are going to push these prices further higher. Going on to a point that you often talk about when you come on, the meat demand monitor and export meat demand numbers. So starting in that conversation, the export meat demand numbers were updated May 24th. Listeners know I do spend a lot of time on meat demand, and it's because you know all the value for the industry starts with what consumers, whether it's foreign or domestically, are willing to spend on beef. So before I lose this in the numbers, I always like to remind us there's basically this three-legged stool. So you've got foreign demand for U.S. meat. You've got the domestic demand through retail, primarily grocery stores for at-home consumption. And then you have domestic demand away from home, you know, think dinner meal at a restaurant kind of thing. So we have different measures for each of those channels. The export demand, the most recent numbers that I have based on USDA information, they were updated right before Memorial Day. They're good through March, so there's a time lag on that USDA trade info in particular. And foreign demand for U.S. beef has continued to slip. Year over year, we've had declines since July. Conversely, foreign demand for U.S. pork has improved since September. Now, in both cases, we're comparing to pretty high bases. So last summer, foreign demand for beef was very strong, while pork demand, foreign demand that is, was fairly weak. So those trends have reversed. But we don't have year-over-year strength on foreign beef demand, and that's worth noting here because we're relying on the domestic market pretty heavily, and that's where the meat demand monitor comes in. And do you predict to continue to see the beef decline and the pork improve? My main thesis on why we've had the decline on foreign demand for U.S. beef is a pause in macroeconomic activity, uncertainty in general, around the world. It's kind of a mixed bag of who you ask if the next 12 months are going to be that way or not. Most think globally inflation has gotten better. So maybe we're towards the peak of interest rates. But if that's the case, then you know potentially we're hitting that peak on interest rates and some 
Federal Reserve parallels around the world might start loosening their monetary policy, which historically stimulates economic activity and then ultimately maybe some buying power. If the U.S. dollar weakens further compared to foreign currencies, that makes our beef cheaper on the global market. So that is possible as well. I'm sort of neutral. If you put a, you know, ask me, is it going to get better or worse? I think it'll probably get a little bit better, but I don't see it rallying a lot because there's still some macroeconomic gray clouds on the horizon. Glenn, talking about a subject you're passionate about, obviously, the May meat demand monitor and the retail demand specifically looking at that. The meat demand monitor's beef and pork checkoff fund that looks at both domestic channels. First, the retail demand. Four of the eight categories that we track, and specifically here, ribeye steak, ground beef, pork chop, and bacon, which are the two beef and the two pork, were up in May compared to April. That's great. So think grocery store away from home demand. All categories, so again, we track eight of them, six of the eight. So the two exceptions here would be plant-based patty and shrimp. We're up in May of 23 compared to May of 22. So I usually share both month over month as well year over year changes, and that's what I'm doing there. That is a very new statement. So for several months, I've been talking about year over year declines. And what that's getting at was domestic demand, by most of my estimates, peaked sometime in 2022. But fortunately, here in May of 23, the grocery channel, at least, retail channel we're tracking, Six of the eight categories, including both beef and both pork, were higher in May of 23 than May of 22. It would be wonderful for the industry going forward if that continued. We'll see in a month what the numbers are, but that is a nice development. What about the food service demand, Glenn? Specifically, this is dinner meal. Again, there's multiple meals, and we hone in on the dinner meal. Four meals that we track had demand up in May versus April, and that included the beef hamburger meal, uh, actually the plant-based patties, shrimp, and salmon. So notice the ones I excluded from that list. They would be ribeye steak as well as both pork that are tracked. Actually, we're down in May compared to April. So if you back up for a moment and comment across the two domestic channels, it was a mixed bag. So there's more clear demand strength month-over-month basis here for beef and pork through the grocery store channel than there was through the food service channel in May. And Glenn, something I know you take into account for this is what are residents expecting to see moving forward? Given the fairly unique experience with inflation, about 18 months ago, we started adding questions to the meat demand monitor, asking folks, what do you expect? You know, higher, no change, or low change prices specifically for ribeye, steak, ground beef, pork chop, and bacon next month. And we've summarized that each month in the MDM and all the raw data is there for my fellow geeks out there that want to go pull it up. What I included here for our talking points was in May, folks are expecting a one and a half to 2% increase in June in those retail prices of those two beef and two pork prices that we track. That is right on trend with the last couple months. But what's most important here is it's well below what the expectations a year ago were. Expectations a year ago were three to three and a half percent, you know, increases the upcoming month, consistent with we were living through six to 10 percent inflation, depending on who's measuring what time you talk about it. So expectations for higher meat prices are there, but the rate of those increases indeed has moderated a lot in the last few months. And something we've talked a lot about in the cattle markets leading up this past month was grilling season and Memorial Day, a lot more activity there. And a recent report was released. And so what did that say talking about that time period? I was on U.S. Farm Report with Tyne Morgan, and you know she tends to, around Memorial Day, do a segment honed in on that of uh, primarily the Mean Man Monitor data, not just in a recent month, but basically since inception. But I'm giving folks that reminder is the video for that report is on YouTube. You know, the full 10-page report is on Ag Manager again on the MDM page and so forth. So if you find interest in this. But the punchline would be is both retail and food service domestic meat demand peaked in the middle of, of 2022 and was declining notably as we got to April of 2023, which was the latest data in this report. That decline was notable. But importantly, in April of 23, demand was still above what it was when we launched the project in February of 2020. So we've had a notable decline from the peak, but demand is still above what it was sort of pre-pandemic. That's important because context matters here. You know, I truly believe demand has slipped in the last 12 months, but context is important that it's not like the, you know, people are running away from beef, pork, and chicken. They still want to have meat protein in their diets. But another thing we track is your household financial situation. And about 80% of the public, specifically in April of 23, told us their household finances are the same or worse than they were a year earlier. It means there's only 20% that said their finances have improved. That allows us to segment meat demand and meat consumption and importance of price and a lot of other things by those different cohorts. Are, has your finances improved? Are they the same? Or are they worse? And there's a very strong relationship, and that's not surprising. The segment of the public, and again, it's about 20%, that say their finances have improved 
have much higher rates of including beef and pork in their prior day meals. They have much stronger domestic beef and pork demand. Again, we'd expect that 100%, but it's good to confirm it with data like this. And conversely, those, particularly those that say their finances have weakened in the last year, are sort of the opposite. You know, we don't see, you know, stronger meal inclusion and beef and pork demand. But I'll also add in here the relative importance of price in their protein purchasing decision is a lot higher if you say your finances have eroded. But what I was trying to highlight for Tyne in the U.S. Farm Report was we have a lot of diversity on the financial situation, which leads to a lot of diversity in realized meat demand in our country. It's easy to forget we have over 300 million people. You know, we are diverse in every metric you can think of, and it's easy to overlook. There's very strong ribeye demand by some, and there's incredibly weak ribeye demand by some. And the same thing for ground and for pork chops and so forth. We need to understand that and, you know, just be aware of that in general. And Glenn, the World Pork Expo is coming up, and why is that significant to the cattle market? Me and the other experts are on here each week, highlight multiple species with a heavy focus on beef and cattle, but it is a multi-species, multi-protein situation. The pork industry's profitability is quite historically low. You could go back 25 years to the 1998 situation to find parallels. So that environment for the World Pork Expo is of note. At the same time, the political situation and the regulatory situation around Proposition 12 in California is of note. I'm teeing this up because I'm en route to go to World Pork Expo and speak on some of those things, uh, and I'm happy to do that. I mean, don't take the comments the wrong way. But our listeners here that are beef and cattle focused should also be aware of the profitability situation, kind of the disruptions in the domestic pork market and what that might mean for beef, regulatory uncertainty across state borders, what that might mean for your operation and so forth. It's always uh, good to at least be aware of that. That was K-State Livestock Economist Glenn Tonser. The links he mentioned will be found in today's show notes on agtoday.net. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and May was a fun month and a good month for K-State. We had graduation, we had groundbreaking, and just a lot of cool things happening within the university. And then to talk about it, we have K-State College of Agriculture Dean and Director of K-State Research and Extension, Ernie Minton. Ernie, thanks for joining us today. I'm happy to be here, happy to uh, visit with you about the topics we have to cover today. Thank you. Thanks for coming. And to get started, I think we're going to go through your articles that are linked on statewide. Mm -hmm. And to get started, kind of exciting news. Jane Shu is coming to lead K-State's College of Agriculture Research Program. Yeah, that's right. And the first thing I want to do is acknowledge my valued colleague, uh, Dr. Marty Draper, uh, who's been in that role for a few years now. Marty has been such a great asset for our leadership team I think he's interacted well with all the stakeholders. And, you know, as Associate Dean for Research and Graduate Programs, you come in knowing the discipline that you were trained in quite well, uh, but you have to be versatile and you have to be willing to learn. And, and Dr. Draper certainly uh, did a great job with that. Uh, he, he, for example, he's a plant pathologist by training, heavily involved in some feed mill renovations that we were uh, involved in. That's just one example of of uh, what Marty did. But we're excited, too, about Dr. Jane Shu, who spent her career at North Dakota State University. We have a theme there with uh, athletics uh, being supplied with uh, people from North Dakota State University and now the Associate Dean for Research and Graduate Programs uh, from NDSU as well. So Jane is, uh, you know, more of an immunologist, and so her, her role is is uh, or her, her discipline, I should say, is probably closer to animal science, to, to livestock kinds of issues. But she she works very well with the stakeholder groups as well, the grain commissions and so on. And, and we're really, really excited about Jane arriving. And Jane will be arriving on campus on July 1. So excited to see her here? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. She'll You know, she's already been in contact with Marty. They've been overlapping a little bit. That happens. When you take a new position at a new institution, you actually do two jobs for a short period of time. Uh, But, yeah, uh, she'll be here um, before you know it. Another story to mention is Long Singer Farms. I know we've talked about it here a little bit on agriculture today, but really just a pretty cool opportunity for K-State Research and Extension. 
You know, it really is. First of all, we've acknowledged before, and it's when we talk about the Lonsinger property, it's always a good thing to fondly remember the Lonsingers and the commitment they made to, to the college and K-State Research and Extension and the opportunity we have to really develop out uh, that farm to be a model for sustainability. That was Mr. Lonsinger's vision that his property would be used to help us understand uh, sustainable agriculture production. And when uh, when we took possession of that property, there were a number of, of maintenance items that we needed to take care of. And I want to give full credit to the crew at our Hayes uh, Experiment Station uh, who really took the lead in getting you know, fencing, gravel on roadways, those kinds of things that are necessary to make a really robust research facility uh, operate. And they've done that. There's more work to do, but in terms of, of, of pastures and that kind of thing. But we're really excited about getting started there. A lot of research and education to be received from Longsinger Farms. And talking about education, rising temps and drought are creating an increase possibly in aflatoxin in corn. You know, this this points up the kind of the uncertainty of, of what may be happening in, in Kansas weather going forward. And there's not much that we can do, uh, you know, in real time about that except to understand what the challenges are and be prepared uh, to to deal with them. And so this is why we have um, agronomists and plant pathologists uh, working together to understand what those threats are and give our best uh, advice to producers to understand what their, their options are. One more topic or one more story included in statewide is volunteers. Obviously, they have a big impact on Kansas 4-H. And being through 4-H, I definitely saw the impact, and I'm happy to be giving back at that point. And in April, we celebrated National Volunteer Week. And so this month, we're talking about the financial impact that volunteers have had on Kansas 4-H. Yeah, that's a really good point and one that I'm pleased that we can raise up and kind of emphasize with this interview 4-H in particular, among all the extension programming, relies most heavily on volunteers to help make things happen. This happens particularly at the at the local level with volunteers really running 4-H clubs. And so this helps us out tremendously versus having to have the resources to staff those with, with K-State employees, for example. But the other thing that that does is it it keeps 4-Hers really connected to our stakeholders. And so uh, that's another important aspect of volunteerism and the impact that they have on uh, on our 4-H programs. Definitely. some And stories that really encase research and extension, what's important to K-State Research and Extension. And talking about what's important to K-State Research and Extension, May 15th, we had groundbreaking. What makes you excited about the fact of moving that forward? Well, I know we have a limited time on this segment, so I won't riff and free will forever and ever, but I have been at K-State since uh, August 18th, 1983. So this year is my 40th year. I've been in the dean's office as, actually, I had Marty Draper's job previously from 2008 to 2018. And during that period of time, I began to understand that, that we really needed a refresh on some of our uh, our facilities. And so What's so important about this uh, groundbreaking is it represents the beginning of, you know, our phase one collection of projects, which includes projects out at the North Agronomy Farm, a livestock competition arena that will be located on the hill adjacent to the Stanley Stout Center, and then one of the bigger projects, well, the biggest project of all three of those will be what we're calling the Global Center for Grain and Food Innovations, and so Eventually, we're going to need to take uh, Schellenberger Hall and Feed Technology Hall down, so we're going to raise those buildings, which means we need to have a new home for the Department of Grain Sciences and Industry. And, of course, one choice would be take the building down, rebuild on that same site. But rather than do that, what we had planned is to bring that building up between Call and Weber Hall and have our baking and milling science faculty interact with uh, food science faculty. They're mostly in Call Hall and then the feed and pet food uh, faculty to interact with our uh, livestock nutritionists who are they're in both Weber and Call Hall, but that adjacency. We want, want to also create the nation's premier student experience in those buildings as well. 
So there's a tremendous amount of excitement with this first project kind of kicking off the, that suite of projects we have planned. And making all this happen, a lot of stakeholder support to get it off the ground and get going. And one that I know you'd like to mention is Eldon Gideon. Mm -hmm. And part of that is a deanship. And I'm just curious, what is a deanship? Yeah, I'll get to that. Let me acknowledge uh, Mr. Mr. Gideon uh, has degrees uh, from from K-State, animal science, and I believe also agronomy. But very, very generously uh, made a donation to name the dean's position here at Kansas State University. And this would be the fourth uh, named dean here at at K-State. So, yeah, I had a stakeholder uh, just ask me last week about what what that really is. And essentially what it is is it is a financial donation, a substantial one, that is endowed. So it takes a few years to begin to generate income off that endowment. But what it allows you to do as dean is to really use those proceeds to enhance the work of your faculty. And that's what I'm looking forward to doing uh, with with that deanship. So that's what that's all about. And henceforth on letterhead and that sort of thing, uh, the dean's position happens to be me now, but it'll be someone different in the future, will be the Eldon Gideon Dean of Agriculture. Ernie, a lot of fun things and good things happening at K-State. What makes you excited as we enter into summer? Well, the summertime is is a great time uh, at K-State. The weather is, of course, really, really great in May. When we have graduation, it's the conclusion of a cycle that begins in in the fall semester when students arrive on campus. And if they're freshman students, you know, this is the beginning of the next chapter of their career. And so in May, we celebrate the conclusion for seniors uh, of that chapter as they conclude the, the requirements for their bachelor's degrees. And they may be going on for graduate degrees or they may be heading to their first uh, full-time job. Uh, and so it's, that, that part is an exciting part. But the summertime really also begins the season for what our, our faculty are doing in the field And so right after uh, graduation, the very next week, we had the groundbreaking for the agronomy pieces of our innovation uh, initiative. And then the very next morning, Dr. Draper and I left for the uh, Kansas Wheat Quality Tour. It's those kinds of events that remind you about what we do in the field and the impact that we have on Kansas agriculture. Ernie, I appreciate you coming in and giving us an update of what happened in May for K-State Research and Extension and the College of Agriculture. Well, thank you very much. Great to be here. That was K-State College of Agriculture Dean and Director of K-State Research and Extension, Ernie Minton. If you would like to subscribe to his statewide newsletter, it will be linked in today's show notes, which, as always, can be found on agtoday.net. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and on this Monday, we end our show with a wildlife segment and kind of continuing the conversation from last week, we have K-State Wildlife Specialist Drew Ricketts. Yeah, Shelby, thanks for having me. I thought we would continue to talk about feeding wildlife and some of the intended and unintended consequences that come along with that. And so getting started with that, concentrating deer near deer feeders, does that create a problem possibly for crop producers? It can. So I go visit lots of farms that have damage by white-tailed deer. And one of the things that I commonly see at some of those farms is that there are white-tailed deer hunters who want to attract deer to a spot, and they do that by placing a feeder And that was one thing that we didn't quite get to last time is the fact that those deer feeders can concentrate deer activity around fields, which can lead to increased crop damage. Something you mentioned before we got started, bird feeders also have a similar effect almost as deer feeders. They do. So anytime we put out food for wildlife, we're attracting critters to a spot, concentrating activity and that sort of thing. And one of the things that that I deal with a lot is nuisance wildlife. And in urban areas, 
or rural areas, but especially urban areas, we can see that raccoons are seven times more likely to be in yards with bird feeders. Deer are two times more likely to be in yards with bird feeders. And other carnivores like coyotes and red fox and those sorts of critters are at least one and a half times more likely to be in yards with bird feeders. And so, you know, folks are oftentimes inadvertently attracting critters to the yard that cause problems that don't have anything to do with the bird feeder. But one of the things that I would suggest to those folks is to think about how they might be contributing to that situation by having food available in the yard. And more than just also wildlife, we have hawks and cats might also take advantage of a localized food source. That's correct. So when we concentrate birds at a bird feeder that might be prey species for other wildlife, we create sort of a buffet for other bird species that might want to prey on those prey species. So I I do at least once a year get calls from folks who are feeding birds in their backyard and they want to know how to stop this hawk from hanging out in their yard that is eating the birds. And, And there's really nothing you can do about that. And it's just nature taking its course, right? You're concentrating these prey species that you want to see in your yard, that hawk's going to be there, and we can see increased rates of predation because of that. We can also see increased rates of predation around bird feeders by domestic cats and those sorts of predators too. And you mentioned beforehand that this might be feeding birds is something more people do for people and might have an unintended consequence, for example, during winter feeding. Typically, we put feeders out so that we can see birds and because it makes us feel better, right? But the reality is that the the feeling better part of that comes from the fact that we think that we're doing the birds some good by putting food out there. And that food is something that they typically don't need even during the winter time, and it can have unintended consequences later in the year. So one study actually looked at reproductive performance of birds the following spring after they had been fed during the winter time. And what they found was that the chicks from birds that were fed during the winter weighed less, they were smaller, and they had poor survival than birds that were not fed during the winter time. So they actually saw reduced reproduction in those birds that were fed during the winter time. And once again, the idea of concentrating everything in one central location has parasites and disease consequences. Just like we saw with other critters, we see increased incidence of diseases like coccidiosis, avian pox. We can also see increased infections of lice and mites and intestinal parasites in birds that use bird feeders versus birds that don't use bird feeders. And so for someone who's really dedicated and would like to still see their birds come around, is there something they could do to help reduce diseases from their bird feeder? Yeah, for folks who are wanting to reduce diseases spread at bird feeders, one thing that they can do is on a daily basis, so at least once every 24 hours, clean that bird feeder with a 10% bleach solution and then rinse it off really good. Drew, thank you for coming in and sharing some more information about feeding wildlife this time of year. Thanks for having me, Shelby. That was K-State Wildlife Specialist Drew Ricketts. If you'd like to hear more about the deer feeding, we'll link that interview in today's show notes, which you can find on agtoday.net. That's all we have for you today, but we'll be back with you tomorrow. Tomorrow.